Sure, we are recording. Okay. okay, so great, let's get started. Uh, as I said, now for everybody online too, welcome to Visualization for Data Science. Um, in this class, you will be learning how to visualize data so that it's actually readable by humans, so that you can actually communicate some complex data set uh, to a human to leverage both like what the computer can do for you and what the humans can do with your data. So I like to start both my lectures and my talks with this quote. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. Richard Hamming is a famous computer scientist who worked at Bell Laboratories for a long time. Um, and nobody would really dispute this. If I run like a supercomputer or a cluster, uh, my intention is to learn something, like to simulate the weather or something like that. However, if you just modify that quote slightly, you get to the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. Again, this doesn't sound very controversial, but it turns out that this is not something that a lot of people like, take to heart. I see a lot of really, really bad visualizations out there that are mainly made to make your content look nice, like as a design piece to like, make it stand out, to be colorful, and to not have so much text. And you would believe that this is the true case for things like magazines and so on, but it's actually also true in science communication. So here I have a simple example. These six different plant species here, banana, date, cress, rice, sorghum, and brome, all of them are important for food, uh, important food sources. Um, they all also have fancy Latin names, um, and they also have something else in common. They have an evolutionary relationship. So people would like to understand how are these plants related to each other genet genetically. Uh, and to do that, what we can do is we can analyze how many like sequences, how many genes do they share. And then we have like this, like these six plants are considered sets. We have like about 20 or 30 or 40,000 genes and we can count which gene is in which plant. And so this is how people actually try to visualize this. This is a six set Venn diagram of the banana genome. This is not some random block that I've taken this from, but this was a nature paper in 2012. Uh, when the banana genome was published. And I, I like to show this picture because this is exactly what I've been talking about. It is a terrible visualization. <laughs> it's really only made to like, make your article look nice. I would even argue that if you just gave me a table of the data, it would be more usable. And why is that? Well, there's a couple of things wrong with this chart. First, up here, we have like a tiny, tiny segment that represents 1,151 genes. That's one of the biggest intersections in this data set, and it barely gets any screen space on this visualization. And right next to it, equally prominent, there's a segment with only 40 genes. So there is no relationship between the importance of a data set here or a data point to its prominence on the screen. Conversely to that, down here we have like a gigantic chunk with only 105 genes. So there's something clearly wrong with this chart, and in this lecture we'll learn how to do better. So what is visualization? Well, if you look at a dictionary, um, you will see something like the formation of mental visual images, or the act or process of interpreting in visual terms or of putting into visual form. You'll hear it like in like common language, visualization is also something like um, a little bit from the metaphysical area, like you visualize yourself in some kind of like happy place or cave or something like that. Um, but what we care about it's like a, def a different definition of visualization. So visualization is a process that transforms potentially abstract data into interactive graphical representations for the purpose of exploration, confirmation, or presentation. So this definition has a couple of things in them. So first, it's about a process that transforms data into something visible. Second, it's about data. And abstract data or concrete data will come to what I mean by that. And then here, like, you can like, certainly say that visualization is also part like, of making charts and figures, like bar charts and pie charts and so on. But what we will be uh, learning here is like, we'll learn about that, but we'll also learn about interactive visualization on a computer, on the web specifically, uh, in this course. Um, so it's really like, about computer-assisted interactive graphical representation, just because interaction gives us so much more power of what we can do. It's still like, it's not easy to make a great chart for print, for example, but it's much harder and much more challenging, yet much more interesting to make an interactive chart or to make an inter interactive visualization that people can interact with. And then the purpose here, we have three different purposes, exploration, confirmation, and presentation, and I'll get into those a little bit more. 
But what makes a good data visualization? It's really about making data accessible. And I'll be hitting on that theme today a lot. It's about combining the strengths of humans and computers. This is like another very important part of it. It's not, this is not your typical CS class. You will not be like proving runtime complexities or implementing efficient algorithms or anything like that. We have, like this is a class that is very focused on the combination of humans and computers. We care a lot about designing. We care a lot about what can humans perceive, what is efficient, what is an efficient way to communicate to a human. So it's not, we never think of anything here in isolation as computer scientists, but we really think of our, like, you should, like, if you come to this class, you should think of yourselves as somebody who creates interfaces for human consumption. Uh, good data visualization is about enabling insight. You should be able to read something from a chart and learn something from exploring a visualization. And it's also very helpful for communication. So I'll show a lot of examples from really great graphics departments from around the country and internationally. Specifically, the New York Times graphics department is one of the best out there. They have really great interactive visualizations, and I'll, show, I'll be showing a lot of examples. In my personal work, um, this like, kind of communication aspect is not as important as it will be in this class, but um, these are just so great examples that they are easily to communicate, so we will be using a lot of those. So this is Stuart Card, uh, who is a famous researcher um, who worked with Sirius Park, I think. Um, and he, he thinks about visualization is really about external cognition. That is how resources outside the mind can be used to boost the cognitive capabilities of the mind. So what does he mean by that? What he means is that we don't, we're not able to simply look at a data file, like an exact cell spreadsheet, read everything and then process it in our heads. This is like, we're not good at that. We need something like a chart, like a scatter plot, or whatever other visualization technique to simply like look at things in, like, in sequence, uh, spot correlation, spot trends, and so on, um, and essentially then bring that into context with, with what else we see. So it's, it's about like this, like things that make us smart. Like we can, by looking at something, we can kind of like focus on, on some sub part, and then think about how does it fit into the picture, bigger picture. Look at the next part, and so on. So it's kind of like a mental aid. So why do we want to visualize? I, I mentioned this, this um, aspect of like, communication versus exploration. Um, so first um, is communication, to inform humans. So for example, uh, we can ask a question like, who is ahead in the election polls? And I'm glad this year is not an election year. Last year I had a lot of election maps, so you'll still see some of them, but it's not going to be as painful, for, at least for me. Um, so when questions are not well defined, we want to use exploration. So what is the structure of a terrorist network? It's something that is not, there's not a clear answer to that, right? You need to look at a network, look at maps, and so on, and you need to kind of like synthesize this information. Or which drug can help patient X? It's not like we know everything about a patient. We need to bring in all the different information. We need to understand a lot about the different drugs, about the side effects, about the patient's clinical profiles. So we essentially, when we have to synthesize a lot of information to make good decisions, we care about exploration. And so here are two examples. This one is uh, an example from my work, Open Exploration, and then here on the right we have a communication chart. This is from the infamous Benini, uh, bikini bar chart, uh, given out by the Obama administration. And so what this chart shows you is job losses in the United States from uh, 2007 to 2010. And so what you can see essentially, like the first part here is under the Bush, at Bush administration. And the job losses, like there were a lot of jobs lost in the, at the end of the Bush administration, which of course coincides uh, with the economic crisis. And then suddenly under Obama, the job losses reduced. But notice that this chart is very purposefully designed. It doesn't show us like um, this flipped around, but it shows these bars pointing downwards. So it tells us like it goes downhill under Bush and suddenly Obama took office and everything is going uphill. We have the colors here. There's a lot of little tricks. So this chart is really designed to communicate. Versus this here is an exploratory piece. So here's another example for communication. Why Peyton Manning's record will be hard to beat. So like, who cares about football in here? <laughs> good, I don't either. <laughs> so this is a good chart. Um, this chart is supposed to be telling you about um, Peyton Manning. Like he, he's supposedly a great quarterback, and he passes a lot. Um, and so he has these touchdown passing records. So you can see that he has 
completed 510 touchdown passes. And so what you see in this chart, and this is, you can actually click on it, most of my slides, I'll post them later, all of the, or most of the images have links that lead you to more content if you go through them. Um, so why is this a good chart? Why is this, what, like, does this communicate well? So here, like, it essentially tells you a couple of things. Peyton Manning, of course, he's leading, like, at this time, uh, he was leading in touchdown passes of a career. Um, then it has, it shows us other important people, and I'm again sorry for the crappy resolution. Uh, we have other important people here, uh, and we see how they perform. And then the active players that, in theory, could still surpass Peyton Manning are shown in, in blue. So here, the, you can, like this chart, communicates, but you can also actually use it to explore. You can hover over these other people here uh, and look at them in more detail. So this is why this is a good communication example. Uh, in contrast to that, here is this, this piece uh, of my own work uh, that we use for cancer subtype analysis. So it turns out uh, biologists and also physicians uh, care about um, what's called a cancer subtype. So nowadays, if you have lung cancer, this is not a specific diagnosis. There's actually many different types of lung cancer, and people want to understand better which biomolecular subtype you have, like which genes are affected in, in your particular case. Because it has a big effect on your prognosis, it has a big effect on interventions such as surgeries, and it has a big effect on which medications are, are ideal for you. And so this, this tool here, for example, allows people to explore here, like we have gene expression data that um, shows us for like a big cohort of patients, 500 patients in this case, uh, and 1,500 genes, what are the patterns of how active these genes are? And we've run a clustering algorithm on this data set, and we have created those four different clusters. And then we want to explore how does it correlate with the copy number alteration in a known cancer gene, like EGFR here. This is a, a known cancer promoter, um, and if you have an amplification in EGFR that is well, like this is highly associated uh, with this is brain cancer particularly, so this is well known to be a factor in brain cancer. So we can see that here this particular block is strongly correlated with an increased number in EGFR. So these are the kinds of things that uh, doctors want to ask. And then you can explore and look at more detail. And now we have, like here, this is a curve of survival times. Um, on X, we have time. On Y, we have the percentage of patients that are still alive at a given time. So this is not a very nice curve. As you know, glioblastoma is not a nice cancer. So after about two years, more than 50% of the patients are dead here. But we can see quite important differences. So those two lower curves here correspond to those patients that have an increase in this, uh, in this particular gene, that have multiple copies of this particular gene. And if you don't have those multiple copies, if you're one of the lucky ones in this white block here, you have much better prognosis. Um, and so these kinds of discoveries can be made by using visualization combined with algorithmic approaches um, to dis for discovery. So why do we use graphics? Well, um, it turns out that our visual system is by far the mo has by far the most bandwidth of all our senses. So we can essentially, we can, you can listen to my voice, but if everybody in here would be talking at the same time, you could not uh, understand what you're saying. But if you look around you, you can see everybody at the same time. So we have, like, our visual system has, like, massive bandwidth. Um, figures are also richer. They provide more information with less clutter and in less space. They provide what's called the Gestalt effect. They give an overview. They make structure visible. Uh, figures are accessible. They're easy to understand. They're faster to grasp. They're comprehensible, they're memorable, which is also quite important. If you have a good graphic, people will remember it. They're more fun and they're less formal. So these are all reasons for using graphical representations. Here's a counterexample. And you probably can't read this, so I'll read it to you. This is from a, a New Yorker article on Hurricane Katrina. And what this text does is describes a map. Campanella then switched to an identically constructed map, only this time based on 2010 census data. And in bits and pieces on the screen, there was a simple and arresting picture of what Katrina meant. In the neighborhoods that were once a dense black, many of the little squares had thinned and turned gray. The sharp lines that once separated the teapot from the central city were now blurry. The white areas of the city were pu pushing north into the vacuum left by the exodus. The bywater was graying as it gentrified still further. And so on. So what this does here is describe a map. This is like very classic New Yorker. They don't print pictures other than illustrations or cartoons. Uh, but why not show a map? Why do you need to explain it here in textual detail? I would say it's really hard to understand what is going on 
uh, you really have to pay careful attention. And if you showed the map, it would be very obvious. So there are reasons not to use visualization, of course. Uh, so there's two main areas. I would say the one, the most important one is actually when you have well-defined questions on a well-defined data set, uh, then you don't need visualization. Like, things like which gene is most frequently mutated in a set of patients. This is like a simple, like you can run an algorithm, you get out a number, or, or in this case, like a, a text uh, field, uh, and you'll have the answer. So if your question is that simple, that well-defined, and all the data that you need is stored in a computer, you don't need visualization. Or uh, what is the current unemployment rate? Again, something that you can look up, you don't need context. However, if you want to understand how does the unemployment rate like, correlate with other um, and economic indices, or how they, did the unemployment rate develop over time, then again, visualization could be very helpful. And then there's also decisions needed in minimal time. Um, so things like high frequency stock market trading, you don't, like, there's no place for a human in the loop because you want to make these decisions in milliseconds. Or if you have, like, have a manufacturing plant, you can use some computer vision algorithm uh, to detect whether a bottle is broken or not, you don't want a human in the loop there. You just want to get rid of that bottle by like, automation. Or things like recommendation systems where it's simply not feasible that a human could provide, like, let's say, reviews your per, um, prior purchases on Amazon and then recommend what next you could buy. This is like something uh, that is simply unrealistic that the human would do it. So in these cases, you want automation. But I would argue that there's a lot of high stakes cases out there where you need the human to make a decision, where you need a human to learn something, and this is where visualization really shines. So here this is like this ability matrix, and don't take this uh, too seriously, like where this is specifically placed, but the idea here is really to compare the performance of a human to the performance of a computer. So we see that computers are great at data storage, at numerical calculation, at searching and finding, at logic, uh, whereas humans are better at planning, at diagnosis, at making predictions, but especially good at cognition, bringing in common knowledge, and at creativity. Uh, the common knowledge is really an important piece because very often not every piece of data you care about is explicitly codified. So, for example, if you give a visualization to a scientist, uh, he or she will always bring in their context, what they've learned in school, or what they've just recently learned by reading a paper when they interpret a figure. So why do we want to use computers? Why not just print? Well, first, or draw by hand, or Illustrator. Well, first, it's infeasible. Like, a, a visualization like this, drawing by hand, of course it can be done, but it's really tedious. And I cannot really draw that for an individual. I can do this for a textbook figure, but this is actually the data from one particular person. So it's simply infeasible. But it's also inflexible. Like, I, we get updates. Um, like drawing uh, stuff by Illustrator and then changing the data is simply terrible. You have to redo your chart from the beginning. But if you use a program to create a chart, then you can simply update your data and you get an update immediately. Uh, and then a very important part is interaction. Interaction allows us to drill down into the data. And so here is a simple, uh, like a short video that, it, like, it's not as important that what this is actually showing. It shows us a, a hierarchy. Um, in this case, it's like a technique called sunburst. We'll be talking about this more in detail. But it, this, like, what this is supposed to show you is that we can simply take a data set and drill down into any of these segments and learn more about them. The labels here are added dynamically. If we added every label for every segment, it would simply be way too cluttered. So we can make use of interaction, uh, of like selectively showing something by letting the user interact with the visualization um, to reveal more about our data. Um, and then by using computers, we can also integrate our visualizations with algorithms, and which you'll see is a very important part. Like for anything that is not trivial, like not a trivial data set, we will need to use something like a ranking algorithm, a clustering algorithm, a dimensionality reduction, or things like that, or layout algorithms and so on to make sense of this. So what we really want to do is make visualization part of a data analysis pipeline. It's not an, an, like a means to an end. It's not an, like it's not the end product. Uh, it, it's not to create a visualization, but essentially it's to create, to make sense of data in some way. And that's why this course is now also called Visualization for Data Science. It's like one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, arguments such as 
Efficiency, we can use reuse charts or methods for different data sets. We can be very precise in how we encode things. Uh, and we can use time for storytelling. So here is the first example where I would need the audio. Mariana Rivera is one of the most can you hear this in the back? In history. But what may be most remarkable is that he has done it by confounding hitters with mostly one pitch, his signature cutter. John Flaherty of the Yes Network faced Rivera as a hitter and also caught him when he played for the Yankees. From a hitter's standpoint, he's out on the mound. It feels like he's not even putting any effort into it, and the ball explodes on you. And from a catching standpoint, uh, he's the easiest guy ever to catch because he throws the ball right where you want it. Rivera uses a seemingly effortless delivery, which he can flawlessly repeat pitch after pitch. His cutter is thrown very much like a fastball, but the pitch has significant lateral movement. He creates and adjusts this movement with the different pressure he puts on the ball with his fingers. The pitch's lateral movement keeps it off the bat's sweet spot, moving in on the hands of a left-handed batter and toward the end of the bat of a righty. To a hitter, Rivera's cutter first appears like a straight fastball, making it hard to distinguish the two pitches during the first fractions of a second when the hitter must decide if, when, and where to swing. Hitters often rely on reading a pitch's spin to determine what pitch is coming, but Rivera's fastball and cutter have what appear to the hitter as the same spin. Many pitchers throw their cutters more like sliders, with their fingers pulling down on the side of the ball. This can create more downward and lateral movement than a cutter, but it also creates the signature spin of a slider, a spinning red dot that the hitter can recognize and adjust to. With identical deliveries and spins on Rivera's pitches, hitters are at a loss to identify and then attack the pitch until it is too late and the balls end up in very different locations. Here are the nearly 1,300 pitches that Rivera threw in 2009, each frozen at the point when the batter must make his swing decisions. But with few clues to determine the pitch's ultimate location, the batter can be faced with guessing at these outcomes. Here are the cutters to left-handers. Here are the cutters to right-handers. And fastballs to right-handers. He throws almost no fastballs to lefties. As this map of his 2009 pitches shows, Rivera is remarkably adept at hitting the corners, keeping the ball away from the middle of the plate, the easiest spot for a batter to make good contact. Looking from this perspective, it's not surprising that the real hot spot is inside on the left. I think he could hit that spot with his eyes closed. Rivera's simple but effective formula has made him baseball's most dominant closer. So yeah, this is what we can do if we have like time as, as an option. We can tell these very engaging stories. This looks like my computer froze. So you think a Mac wouldn't crash, but <laughs> I'm rebooting now. So anybody have any questions in the meantime? Like this is actually what in practice. Like, let's put it this way. Um, we'll be talking about both. Um, we will have a lot of examples where we use visualization for communication and presentation. But like most of the interesting work that is actually happening, for example, in companies or in research, is actually the other the other part. Like the visualization for understanding your data better for exploration. 
and I would consider myself to be an expert in that and less in the communication side of things. However, in teaching, these like communication examples are much often way more accessible, and I don't have to give like a five-minute introduction on what is EGFR and so on. And so, therefore, we'll be using a lot of like New York Times examples as examples. But in practice, like when you do your projects, uh, you will be able to do export or, or let's say, look at your data specifically. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> so, why don't we just use statistics to answer our questions that we have about data sets? Well, um, it turns out like there's many reasons, but one of them is really well exemplified in this particular example. Who's heard of Anscombe's Quartet? Show of hands. This data set here is Anscombe's Quartet. So this is a data set developed by a statistician, Anscombe, um, and it's four different data sets, both with an X and a Y dimension. And so the interesting part of this data set is, that if you look closely, these are not the same numbers, they're different data sets, but if you calculate some summary descriptive statistics, such as the mean, the variance, the correlation, or the linear regression, these are identical, both in X and Y, or the correlation of X and Y, up to two digits after the comma. So statistically speaking, naively, of course, uh, these are identical data sets. But let's plot them. Well, it turns out they are actually quite different. Here we have like a linear trend with some noise, as we would expect. Here we have a nonlinear trend. And then here we have two effects of, like we show the effects of two different outliers. So like you should never trust any statistical calculations unless you have made sure that there's not some weird trend in your data first. So like, plot your data, then run your calculations and your statistics. Turns out you can actually do this in quite a crazy way. Now here we have the dinosaur, and this is like a recent paper from Kai this year in Denver, uh, and you can actually change this dynamically, and notice that the mean, standard deviation, and correlation, even in these intermediate steps here, remains exactly the same. So, like this is this data set, of course, is constructed, but essentially, just using these simple statistics, you can almost fake anything that you, if you wanted to. So, and visualization is just like a sanity check here. Um, so, visualization is really about human data interaction, and this is really the key. If you remember nothing else from today, uh, remember it's really human data interaction. And so, I'll talk about data first, and then I'll talk about humans. And I'll talk then later, we'll start talking a little bit about administrative things. Um, so this is like a graphic that I like uh, that explains the data science process. This is from uh, a book by Rachel Schutt and a colleague, I think. Uh, but anyways, what it shows us is like what happens in like, what everybody nowadays calls data science. We have the real world. We collect data about the real world, then we process the data, which is a very tedious process very often. We clean the data, again, a very tedious process. But then we can make some uh, certain things with it. So we can do exploratory data analysis to understand what is in our data set in the first place. And this is where visualization can be really helpful. If you want to see what is in my data in the first place, like in the example with Anscombe's Quartet earlier, this is where, what happens here. Um, then we, like, on the clean data, we can run some machine learning algorithms, some statistical models, or whatever you like. Um, and then you need to, or you can communicate it. Um, and again, here is the visualization shines. Like we uh, take the data, we take the output of a model, and we visualize it. Um, and then somebody makes a decision based on that data. And there is, of course, the other way of building a data product, like something like the recommendation system on Netflix or on Amazon, uh, or, that I'm, or some image recognition algorithm, something like that that I mentioned before. So like visualization really plays an important role in those two blocks uh, in the data science process. And there's, of course, plenty of other lectures um, in, at the U, uh, in the data program, for example, that take care of these other blocks. But this is just to emphasize that this is part of the process, and this is also why this class is now called Visualization for Data Science, compared to just visualization as it was called last year. 
So everybody's talking about big data, but what does big data really mean? This is just like a couple of things to, to give you a sense of what, what, how much data we produce. This is a little old, but in 2010, uh, humanity produced about 1,200 exabytes, which were largely unstructured, things like videos, images, uh, text. Google stores about 10 exabytes, and the hard disk industry ships about 8 exabytes a year. And this slide is about 3 or 4 years old, so I wouldn't be surprised if that is quite different nowadays. And if you just Google for cat videos, you'll see some trillion cat videos in the Google search results. So there's plenty of data out there for you. And I also like this illustration. If you try to put 15 exabytes in punch cards, um, you would cover New England with 4.5 kilometers of punch cards, just to give you a sense of how big big data is. This is also a nice uh, example. So what happens in one second on the internet? There's like 7,000 tweets. There's 800 Instagram photos, 1,300 Tumblr posts, 2,700 Skype posts, 47,000 gigabytes of internet traffic. Most of that is probably Netflix. <laughs> 60,000 Google searches. Notice my scroll bar. And now YouTube videos viewed, 70,000. That's all in one single second. And now email, more than 2 million email. And here you can see that the dark ones are spam, so probably like <laughs> 60 or 70% of our emails are spam. Okay, so let me grab this. Lots of emails. <laughs> okay. Uh, data can be like this very massive abstract thing, but it can be also something very personal. So here's something like data that I collected about myself. So here are certain, like all the places that I visited last year. Um, like I've been in uh, Ireland, I've been to the UK, I've, I went home to see my parents over Christmas, and I traveled in Germany, France, and then I've been on the East Coast, I did a trip around, uh, around the Great Lakes, I've been to California, uh, and so on. This is the year when I interviewed for jobs, so I traveled quite a bit. <laughs> Um, and then here is like just a single day. Um, I was like, going to work, um, I was um, driving to work, then I walked to the um, cafeteria, um, and then I picked somebody up at the airport. And I didn't explicitly lock that, right? I just was carrying my phone around with me. Uh, and still Google can reconstruct this kind of a profile. Here is another example. This is like me mountain biking the Wasatch Crest Trail. Uh, and like here I recorded this consciously. Um, we have like speed and, uh, and uh, my heart rate um, and the elevation and the pictures that I took on the ride and so on. So this is like this very like this personal data that all of you um, are collecting right now as we speak. Um, big data is of course also a big deal in say science and engineering. So it turns out that um, like as you know CS enrollment is up. Um, lots of people realize that they need computational methods. Um, for example, at the University of Washington, and I don't know the numbers for, for Utah, but the computer science is now the biggest degree at the University of Washington. Like Harvard now, like I was the postdoc at Harvard before coming here. Harvard now, the biggest class at Harvard is now the computer science introductory, an introductory class. And that's because everybody realized we need like some kind of like data is that important in science and engineering. Um, so it's not just about transforming industry. So here are a couple of examples. Large physics experiments and observations, like the Large Hadron Collider, I have more uh, about these. Cheap genome sequencing, smart buildings, smart cities, um, geospatial imaging, um, and so on. So there's also a controver controversy here about like, science, the scientific process. Can I go like, on fishing expeditions and just learn something from my data without having a hypothesis first? Or do I need to have a hypothesis first and then try to answer that? which one of those is the rigorous method to conduct science. And that's like, I, I would say like many scientists would argue that hypothesis driven uh, is kind of the gold standard, but then data driven methods produce results. Uh, we have to be careful, but they produce results. So here's just like an example of the CERN Large Hadron Collider. You can actually go to the CERN data portal and download the data. It's 300 terabytes, 300 terabytes uh, so you'll need a big uh, hard drive, but just like in context, you would need 20,000 Gmail accounts with 15 gigabytes each to store that data, or you need 60,000 DVD-Rs or 6,000 Blu-ray discs, 
or if you like just had wanted to stream that um, uh, the data at the same rate as you would do audio streaming on Pandora, for example, it would stream 1,230 years. Uh, so just the data is really, really, really massive. And then uh, the NSA touches about 300 terabyte of data every 15 minutes or so. Like, I don't know exactly the uh, veracity of these, uh, these statements, but at least this was in this popular mechanics article. And then genomics is an area that I'm very interested in. Um, essentially, like we're in, a, in this genomic revolution, right in the middle of it. It's not anymore the privilege of high power government labs to run detailed studies of what is going on in our genomes. You can nowadays take something like this Minion, this handheld device, and get pretty decent genome sequencing results. Uh, things like 23andMe, you can spit it in a bottle and send it in and you'll get um, information about your like, predispositions for certain diseases and the 23andMe will keep your data and use it for scientific uh, studies and of course also to sell it. Uh, or, we can, uh, or we can do things like reconstruct the tree of life just by looking at genomic, uh, genomic similarities. Like we, have, we, we can sequence species and then simply like, try to infer what are their common ancestors. We can like, recategorize so many things that we didn't have an idea about how to do it before. And just TCGAA, for example, this big American project on studying cancer, produced one petabyte of data. Um, there's, of course, like in Utah specifically, there's an NSA Utah data center uh, in Bluffdale, which is not too far from here. So we don't really know how big the storage capacity of that is, but there are different estimates. Um, some estimates, and this is again a couple of years old, is about 12 exabytes. Uh, are stored in that Utah data center. So, what I kind of want to say here is the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, uh, visualize it to communicate it, is going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades because now we really do have essentially free and ubiquitous data. And this is Google's chief economist um, in the McKinsey report in 2009. So now, like I've I think I should, uh, there was not really a need because most of you being in this class are convinced that data is important, but now um, I made a point about that and now let's make, let me make the point about why we need humans in this human data interaction point. So why humans? Well, we can leverage the human capabilities. We are really, 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 really good at discovering patterns. Like if you see a data set and it's plotted in a good way, we can see clusters, we can see outliers, we can see trends. No clustering algorithm is a match uh, to what we can see in a data set, if it's suitable. Of course, there's like, high dimensional data and so on can be a problem, uh, but we are really good at spotting patterns, at spotting clusters, outliers, trends. And we are really good at having contextual knowledge. Like We've learned a lot of stuff about the data that we're interested in, that we bring it to the table when we do an analysis. And then finally, we can take actions. So we learn something from a visualization, then we can uh, take an action to correct it. For example, to prescribe a specific medication to a patient or to buy a specific stock or something like that. Uh, but we also have to design for humans and their limitations. And humans and their perceptual system have quite significant limitations, which we'll start learning about in the first couple of lectures. So it turns out that not everything that can be drawn can be read. I can plot a node link diagram with 2,000 nodes, but then I'll have something like this, and I would argue this is a completely useless figure again. Um, all I, th I see is this is big, there's a lot of nodes, but I have no idea like which, where is this node connected to? There's nothing that I can learn from that other than, oh, this is big. The same is true for this here. Like This is a um, metabolic network of the humans, and it, like, essentially like, all we see here is, oh, it's big, it's impressive, you must have a lot of data, but there's nothing specific we can learn about it. So we have to be more cautious about what we draw, what we can actually perceive as a human. And then there's also inherent limits of our cognition. So this is a good example for that. This is from a psychology paper, it's an actual study. It's a little bit older as you can see by the style. This guy is asking for directions and the white haired the gentleman is explaining it to him. <laughs> and so see, he is completely preoccupied with the task of explaining the direction that he doesn't even notice that he's talking to a completely different person. <laughs> so 
what this, and we'll talk more about this next on um, Thursday, uh, what this means is that we have certain like shortcomings in our visual system, but also in the way our brain works. Um, and we have to be aware of those limitations when we design visualizations. So next I want to talk a little bit about like the history of visualization. How did we get here where we are? Like first, um, this quote it things that make us smart. Like people used to externalize and record things, either in writing or in pictures. Like these are old cave drawings, and I'm not gonna go like not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is really just about externalizing something and learning something too. Like we have like um, music is recorded, or we have illustrations, uh, or we have like here illustrations in a mathematical textbook. Um, and this is like one of the old, or these are two examples of really old uh, maps. So this is like 6,200 before Christ. We have a map of a city in Turkey. So you see there's a volcano, and then you have different uh, buildings on that map of this city or this village. Um, and then here we have uh, a map of the Mediterranean with Europe. You can clearly tell Italy apart here. Um, and of course you see that like people drew what they knew, right? This is like an incomplete picture, of course. Um, but we can see the Mediterranean is there. There's Europe, there's Libya, and there's Asia. Um, and then we have, like, there's a lot of, like, recordings um, in, in, like, a medical context or in an astronomy context or in a plant biology context where people have created these really elaborate illustrations that were used to study things that you couldn't, like, easily see um, by hand. So we have like here a figure by Leonardo da Vinci, Galileo Galilei, and William Curtis. Um, and then like, visualization, or in this case actually photography, um, can be used to record, but it can also be used to answer questions. Like it was very fashionable, like in the mid of the 19th century, to argue about whether like a horse, when it's galloping, whether all of the hooves live, leave the ground at some point, or whether some hooves are always on the ground. And it wasn't something that was like, unambiguously resolved until Evan Muybridge came along. And so what he did is he created, like these are, are, are essentially like a little video, but of course that's not how it looked like for them. Uh, what he did is he set up a lot of cameras and then had little wires that the horse ran through. Uh, and these wires tripped like the, um, the shutter and then he took this series of pictures. And here you can actually see that there are certain moments uh, in time, like here, where all of the legs of the horse are actually in the air. So he could answer this question by using this visual method. Um, a completely unrelated anecdote, just because whenever I look at the slide, I have to think about it. This guy, Mike Muybridge, he was a benefactor of Stanford. Um, and uh, he did a lot of these photographic studies, but he also had a very young wife. And so his wife got pregnant, and he suspected that it's not his child. And he later found out that it was, in fact, not his child. So he went to see the, like, uh, the lover of his wife uh, and shot him in cold blood. And then he was um, like arrested for it. And he tried to, uh, to, uh, to use an insanity plea. But the insanity plea didn't, plea didn't work. But the jury then um, acquitted him because of justifiable homicide. <laughs> so different times. <laughs> Um, here are like all of these, um, all of these examples here are what I would call like non-abstract data, spatial data. They show something specific, right? They show something that we can see in the real world. These are examples of abstract uh, representations. So here we have a planetary movement data diagram or a wind map, which were, was of course very important for sailors to understand what are the major trends of winds between different um, places. Um, so these are like early examples of when people try to codif codify abstract information. Like a very, very important uh, uh, person here is William Playfair, who uh, was British, and he uh, did an analysis on, on various like economic, um, um, let's say, data sets. So here, for example, we have um, the import-export balance um, for and against England. So you can see that up to 70s, 50 about, um, there was like, um, England ran a trade deficit and afterwards it actually ran a trade surplus. This is what this figure shows us. Um, here we have imports and exports 
to, uh, to and from Scotland in a bar chart. It's like a line chart, a bar chart. And then here we have a pie chart that shows us the proportions of uh, the Turkish Empire, on which continent is the Turkish Empire. So as we see, there is like a, a tiny, a small section is African, a small section is European, uh, and then the majority is Asian. And this is like in, not now, it's 1789, obviously. Um, and then, like this is an example that is very often uh, shown as uh, how data visualization was used to help cure diseases or to understand diseases. Um, it turns out that this is actually, um, well, not quite true, but let me first tell you the story about it. So this is a, a map that John Snow in 1845 created for a cholera epidemic in London. And so he had, like, it wasn't known at this time what uh, caused cholera. And so um, he had a hypothesis and he tried to essentially um, show this hypothesis um, by using data visualization. So what, what he did here is take a map of London. So you see, you see here the Broad Street. And then in these little black bars here, he plots the fatal cases. Um, and you can see that there is a concentration of fatal cases around here. Um, and then he highlighted the pumps, or he added the water pumps. Like where are the water sources for those people? And here you can very clearly see that around this water pump, there is like a, a, like there's a big number of cases. But for people where this water pump is closer, um, there is fewer cases. So this was an indication for him that it's probably this disease is in some way waterborne, and that this particular pump is the source of the disease. And therefore, if we shut down this particular pump, we might improve the, uh, the situation in London at this time. And so this is a very famous example. Uh, if you, like, you can see actually people like data biz nerds running around with t-shirts of that map. Um, <laughs> however, it turns out that he, like, some of the claims are that um, he made this discovery because of, because of visualization, but in this case he actually draw, drew the map to convince others to communicate. He had the hypothesis, just wanted to communicate with it. Uh, here's another famous example, again a data, data nerd example. Um, you can actually see this in some television shows, people have it on their uh, wall as a wallpaper. Um, but anyways, what this shows you is like um, Inaba, he was a famous um, like early data this person in 1869. And this shows Napoleon's campaign. And some people have called this the greatest visualization of all time because it shows so many things at the same time. So what it shows us, it shows us we start here in Paris and this is the march on, on the Russian campaign of Napoleon uh, where he tried to conquer Moscow. Um, and so Napoleon starts out with this massive army. Here the width of this like ribbon uh, encodes the size of the army. And they march towards Moscow. And you can see that the, like, certain branches, uh, certain parts of the army branch off to do something else. Um, but you can see that it's continuously declining. And that's because essentially people are dying on the way without specific fighting happening. It's just this transition. And it was also a very, very cold winter. Um, and here, down here, you can see actually a graph of the temperature. And you can see that in, at the battle in Moscow, there's not actually a lot of lives lost. Uh, but on the retreat, uh, there are a couple of river crossings <coughs> where large numbers of, uh, of the soldiers drown and freeze to death. Um, especially here, if you see like this river crossing, about half of the remaining army perished in that particular river crossing. Um, and you can see that Napoleon returned back home with only a sliver of his original army. And so this is considered to be like a prime example of data visualization. Of course, this is very, very tailored. So we're not going to be creating these kinds of visualizations um, automatically, although you can. Uh, but um, in practice, this is something where you have a lot of like manual encoding. Uh, and then there's a lot of maps, um, especially underground maps. And like usually, if you have things like um, hiking maps or even street maps, um, people try to be faithful to the um, to the topology. Um, but of course, we'll talk. We have a we'll have a lecture on maps. There's like projections and so on. But if you do public transport networks, it's not always that it's important to keep to be faithful to the topology. So you can do certain, like you can make certain compromises. So for example, this is a subway map of, pop, uh, of Boston. And whoever knows Boston, it doesn't look like that. <laughs> uh, this is like a simplification, right? It, essentially, it assumes that roughly knowing the direction you're heading is enough. You don't need to um, have like a precise faithful representation of the geo geography here. So it's more important to show the labels clearly to not have any occlusions in there and so on to the designer of this map. 
And so here are two extreme examples, right? There is like, you can actually click on this link on the New York Times, they have a history of the uh, subway map in, the New York, in, in New York, uh, especially in Manhattan. Uh, and you can see this is like, I think the current map. Uh, so the trend is to be a little bit more faithful um, to the geography than it was before. Uh, but here is like an extreme map uh, that it shows this only in a very abstract representation. So you don't have a particular sense of how this is actually routed. All you care about is the stations and where can I make a change or a connection. Um, we will be using computers, we will be using interactive visualization. And so here is just like two important pieces of history for interactive um, techniques. So these like is Ivan Sutherland, who actually has uh, a history in Utah, and Douglas Engelbart. Uh, you might have seen this one, this is the mother of all demos, and I'll show you short clips of both of those. Let me know what you can... Probably hard to hear, but... In order to do this, we can position this bright spot in the middle, middle of the clock that you notice at a desired location. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my right pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the, the screen here, and the other is in my right pen. So I can position this anywhere I want. Now, I lost tracking there. I can move the pen too fast. And that told the computer to stop drawing the line. Well, if you notice that bright... Can you guys hear that, or should I show this next time? ...jump onto the line as I get closer. When the dot in the center of the cross, when you get close to the line, it jumps over onto a crack. What was it? It's much like a gravity field at the end point, even a higher gravity field, to allow us to position the point exactly on the line, or in this case, exactly at the end point. This allows me to move my pen quite carefully. He's sloppy while I'm drawing, and get a precision drawing out. So well, now I'm going to draw a second line. And even a third one. Now, in an ordinary uh, pencil and paper drawing, all we have is this particular picture. But the computer understands the geometry of the drawing here. What do I mean? I mean that if I point at this particular point and tell the computer to move that point by another push button command, it will move not only that point, but all three lines that are attached to it. Isn't that exciting? It's doing what you want it to, because it's computing all these changes. That's correct. <laughs> now, if I made a mistake, I could delete my mistake. Okay, mistakes. so, editable graphics. Um, again, links, these, like, especially the next one is a very long video, uh, and if you're interested in these, uh, just click on the links and it'll take you to the YouTube video. So, having gone through these items, I'd like to come in now and begin to tell you something about the implementation. So I'm going to open up under here and talk to you about the control techniques control devices, control dialogue, and control meta language that we're using. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot where you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called a mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. It'll show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrew's hand in Menlo Park. And in a second we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. Those are very exciting. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. Alright, as it moves up or down or sideways, so it's a tracking spot. And the, the principles for its operation are quite easy to see. You'll turn it over, Don. 
Can you hear me, Don? Let's turn it over. See, right? This principle is that there are two wheels that grow on the surface. But since they're right angles and kind of sharp edges, one roll and the other slide in one direction. Each of, it, each of these wheels controls the potentiometer with the voltage output sampled by an AD converter. The numbers taken in by the computer at sample times as to what the horizontal vertical confluence are to be of where it should put the track point. So this video is notable for many, many different things. Um, they show collaborative text editing. Uh, they show live video conferencing, they show new mouse interface, uh, like the new uh, interfaces, one moment and the mouse, this like keyboard display didn't really take hold, but of course the mouse is something that we've been using like a ton. Uh, and of course we have different input modalities now, right? We can like, we use mainly, like the main new one is of course touch devices, um, and we'll be actually, I'll be adding a lecture on unconventional display, display devices and mobile visualization this year. Um, so this is going to be exciting. Um, and if you're interested in kind of the history of like these early human computer interfaces, please take a look at the rest of this video. There's like a lot of all, um, a lot of great stuff in here and it's called the mother of all demos. Okay. So let me give you a couple of modern examples of data visualization techniques. That's not quite as modern, but it's still great uh, to, to go about it. So this is like a data visualization of the popularity of baby names, uh, I think it's in the United States. So you can see there's like quite a variety of names and I can hover over them um, and the boys are blue, the girls are red of course. Um, and I can hover over those um, and I can see like here James was for example in 1910 it was a very popular name, it was number three. Uh, but you can see that this its rate decreases. Or compared to that John was number one in 1910 uh, but it decreases. And then if I click on that, I can reveal more information about that. And here I can now see how many babies per million birth are called John. And you can see it was very popular, like about almost like more than a third in 1880 were called John. And now it's only very few of them. So anybody want to test their name? Alex. Alex. <laughs> Uh, this is so wait, uh, let me go back. There is a better way of doing this up here. So uh, Alex. So there's a couple. Alex itself is here, uh, and you can see that it was quite popular in the 1990s, but kind of decreased since. I also like I checked my name before I, when I prepared this lecture, and my name was most popular. Like Alexander was most popular in 1980. Guess when I was born. <laughs> 81 actually, but my parents were not very creative. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Carolina. Carolina. Oh, you're kind of like also plateaued in the 80s. <laughs> 84. 84, yeah, it's probably like good. <laughs> but you rank 285 and like, like a slight drop. Anybody else want to try one? John. What's it? Taylor. Taylor. Wow, there is a massive, <laughs> massive peak for girls. Like probably some television show uh, had a had a famous Taylor. Anyone else? Zach. Zach. Cool. Like Zachary. Zachary. In, in different uh, like writing styles, quite a peak. In mid '80s, and then quite a drop. Like, what's a what's a anybody friend baby just recently born? Heber. Heber. Oh, that's like a <laughs> especially. Paxton. What's it? Paxton. Paxton, like this. Yeah, it's kind of distorted, but. P A X, I think. P A X T O N. Sorry. Okay. That's a recent trend name, huh? <laughs> okay, um, I would guess like, uh, let's say Emily. E Emily. Uh, I would like the French spelling. No, not really. Okay, 
So like this is actually um, a tool that is, was created like a while ago by another famous visualization researcher. Um, and his wife is actually also selling a book on baby names. So they kind of teamed up for that project. Uh, but it's fun to explore. And you can see surprisingly often that your parents were not as creative as they hoped. <laughs> And then, of course, like communication. And who's heard of Hans Rosling before? A couple of people here. Hans Rosling was a Swedish professor of public health at the Karolinska Institute, and unfortunately, he passed away this year. Um, I actually saw him give a talk, uh, and he's just like this. He has an agenda of educating people about public health, especially in developing countries. Um, but uh, he's also this most entertaining person that you could imagine. He's actually he would swallow swords. Uh, in a TED talk when he was talking about public, about public health. Um, so let me show you this particular talk. Again, it's not going to be great because of the audio, but it just shows you what you can do with the task narration. To teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought, maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pre-test when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did this so I got the confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I won 1.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. But one night, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unethical study of the professors of the Caribbean case <laughs> that hands up the Nobel Prize in medicine and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> so this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did the software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. Uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. Uh, this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Eh? And they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world? I said, well, that's long life and small family. And third world is short life and large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families and they had relatively short lives. 
Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see. We stop the world. And this is all the UN statistic that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They are moving. Up. There is better health. They are improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV okay. epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. <laughs> so yeah, if you found this entertaining, there's more TED videos from him uh, and they're all really interesting. Okay, so this is my introduction and now we'll talk a little bit about formalities. What is this class going to be like? What do you have to do to do well in this class? And so on. First, to start a little bit about talking about us. I already introduced myself in the beginning when our camera is broken, but um, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Computing. I'm also in a ski institute. My research area is data visualization, specifically information visualization, very often applied to molecular biology or health data. Um, before I came here two years ago, I was a lecturer and a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, and I got my PhD in Austria at Graz University of Technology. This is just a picture of like, the, the mountains that mountain I kind of like grew up close to, uh, and I like to go hiking, and that's also why I really like being here in Salt Lake City. Um, I run a lab together with Mariah Meyer, so some of you might have um, you might know Mariah. She's also teaching an ACI class uh, right now. Um, and here, is a little, like, here are our postdocs and PhD students. And if you want to learn more about our lab, you can go to VDL, Visualization Design Lab, .sci.utah.edu. Um, there we have like our papers, our research projects, um, and like some information about ourselves. And then we're looking for students. So if you're a PhD student in the first year and they're thinking about a rotation and are interested in like human-centered computing or uh, data visualization, uh, we're happy to talk to you guys um, about it. And if you do well in this class, I'm also happy to work with master students, um, um, in, for example, in the next semester. Um, I'm part of the Ski Institute. The Ski Institute is like a separate entity from the School of Computing. So the Ski Institute is an interdisciplinary institute. This is kind of like my research home, my academic home for teaching and so on is the School of Computing. Um, but what we do at the Ski Institute is scientific computing, biomedical computing, scientific visualization, information visualization, and image analysis. And these are here the headshots of our faculty. And so we are split between, um, like, I would say more than half are in the computer science, and the School of Computing Computer Science Department, uh, a, a quarter or a third um, is in um, biomedical uh, engineering, and the rest of them are mathematicians. So it's like this interdisciplinary institute. If you want to learn more about it, here's the link to our website. Um, so a couple of words about my research. Um, I work on large multivariate biological networks. Like here is an example of biological pathways. Like it's really hard to see, but Anyways, this is like um, a connectomics, brain connectivity data set to understand which kind of, uh, uh, which kind of uh, brain neurons uh, connect to each other. This here is um, a path-based like path analysis of like a big co-author network. It could also like, be applied to an intelligence network um, and, or to a biological network and so on. Like these are all, like you'll find, if you're interested in these, are, these are on my website. Um, I work in multidimensional data. Um, I've actually developed a solution to the banana Venn diagram. Uh, I'll talk about it sometime in the class. Uh, we have developed a method for multivariate ranking um, that is quite popular. You've seen this one here. This is some of my genomic work. Uh, and this is like an example for um, genome data analysis, alternative splicing, mRNA seq data. Um, here is a data set that is very unique to Utah. This is a genealogy. Like, um, in Utah, we have really great genealogical data sets, which we can use for population health uh, studies. 
And this actually shows you a suicide data set. So these families, this is actually Carolina's work, who is going to be your TA. Uh, these families have an increased number of suicide. And what we want to do with this project, together with uh, researchers in the psychiatry department, um, is to look at what other conditions um, appear in these people that have committed suicide, um, and can we find something else in their families to essentially develop more specific phenotypes that we can then use to find genetic underpinnings, genetic causes of suicide. Um, and like, these are kind of the kinds of questions that we're interested in. Like just having mentioned Carolina, she's going to be our teaching mentor, teaching assistant here in this class, together with Pranav, who is operating the camera right here. And then we're still looking to fill like a third spot. So those people are the, the ones that will be helping you with your homeworks, your project, and so on. Of course, you can always come to me too, uh, but they will be offering office hour for technical content and uh, also teach some labs um, if, when, whenever we need any. So, a couple of questions about you. So we've already had this, like many of you are new to you. Who is in the computer science program, like in a master's program? Let's say CS Masters. Okay, who is a CS PhD student? Okay, who are other PhD students? What areas are you in? EC. EC. Mathematics. Mathematics. Physics. Physics. Mathematics. Mathematics, okay. Any other areas? Biomedical informatics. Biomedical informatics. Right, who is like an undergrad? Who of you is in a CS undergrad program? Any non-CS undergrads here? Okay, great. Uh, who's taking the like the grad version, but is an undergrad? There's two or three people. Yes, honors uh, classes. Um, what else? Who is um, let's say from the U.S. About half. Who is from Asia? India, China, other countries. <laughs> Taiwan, all right. <laughs> Somebody else I missed? Iran. Iran? Great. Um, and Europe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what else did I want to ask? Oh, yeah. Who knows JavaScript? Who knows to program? <laughs> Who does not? <laughs> Okay, good. Uh, what about C and C++? Yeah, majority, Java, Python. Um, any other languages? Okay. Who has like developed visualizations before? Not too many. Who would say of themselves that they're a good designer? They have like a good sense for aesthetics and so on. <laughs> Nobody dares to, but like, I'm sure there's somebody in here. <laughs> okay, anyways, um, these kinds of questions are also in our survey. Um, and I, like, I'm asking these not just like for fun, but I also uh, would encourage you, for example, if you like run a project which is going to be team-based, to maybe team up based on your skills. Like have uh, somebody who is not in the classical CS track, uh, brings in some other uh, knowledge uh, to, to form teams like that, maybe. So let's talk a little bit about the core structure and the goals, and let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I only have two minutes left, but I'm expecting that this will be most interesting to you guys. Um, so, well, I guess what, we, what I really want to teach you is how to effectively visualize data, evaluate and critique visualizations, apply fundamental principles, design your own visualizations, and implement interactive data visualizations. And so these are the kind of the components that we have. There's the lectures, like what I'm doing now. Here I'll introduce theory, uh, but we'll also do a lot of design critique. So this is going to be quite, like if you have taken an undergrad a CS program, this class is going to be a little bit different because um, it is really a lot about design and not in terms of graphic design, but also um, how do we develop these kinds of visualizations. But we will critique a lot. We will uh, give out examples. We will do redesigns. So it's not like your classical, this class is not going to be hard in terms of math or algorithms, but it's actually quite surprising to me how, well, let me, how can I phrase this, how like, creative some of the solutions on the exams are when I give people like, design work. Uh, so uh, my goal here really is to get you comfortable 
with developing your own visualizations, with applying these kinds of skills. And all of, like many of the things that I'm telling you sound, well, this doesn't sound really hard, or this is kind of obvious, but it's surprising how little, how, how like, hard it is to actually apply it when you see it. And so that's what we'll be trying to train here. Um, I'll also be teaching in a little bit of a, like, a more relaxed pace than I usually do um, labs. Um, and Carolina will also be teaching a couple of labs where I really start with like, this is how you do CSS selections. Uh, then I'll introduce JavaScript. Uh, and then we'll like we spend quite a bit of time, like four lectures or so, on learning to use D3. D3 is this data visualization library um, that is very popular. A lot of uh, figures, or a lot of visualizations online are made with D3. And so you will not only learn to visualize data in like a theoretical sense, but you will also learn how to implement visualizations on the web. So you'll, you'll get something web design out of this too. How are you evaluated? Well, homeworks and final projects and exams. The homeworks are here to help you practice your skills. The first four homeworks are going to be one week and pretty simple. So they're not like, especially the first one is going to be really almost trivial. Uh, but just like we want to, you to think a little bit about the technology that we're talking about. Um, and they're going to get progressively harder. And the fifth and the sixth homework are going to be two weeks. And they're going to be hard, not in terms of like, again, mathematically hard, but they're, they're, you will need to, like as in any new programming language or a new library, you will fail a lot and you will have to like show some kind of endurance to get it right. So I really encourage you to start on time and not to try to get stuff done in the very last minute, especially for the fifth and the sixth homework because you will have to implement pretty sophisticated visualization techniques. Um, and then in your final project, you will work in a team to develop a visualization where you can pick your own data set. I'll talk more about these. Um, and I guess, let me just see whether there's something really important and I can kind of pick this up again. Um, so I have a Google uh, Calendar in addition to the schedule here. Um, the Google Calendar will tell you when, uh, when stuff is happening and where it is happening. Um, and then the schedule below gives you context, has the readings and links to the slides and so on. So it only says lecture one, lecture two uh, in the schedule in the Google Calendar and then you can see what is actually happening in that lecture and that lab down here. Um, we have Tuesday, Thursdays are lectures, Wednesday at 6 p.m. in L101, so somewhere down here, will occasionally be a lab on demand based on like introducing the homework, going over one of the D3 things again, and so on. And so Carolina will mostly be running those. Um, and then all of us have office hours. My office hours are at 2 p.m. on Wednesdays. Just come to my office at uh, WEB. Um, so in this building, two floors up, uh, or three, no, many floors up, on the third floor. Um, and um, there is a website. The website has a lot of information, and you should please all read the syllabus from A to Z. Uh, because I, I will be answering a lot of questions, uh, and I don't want to say always, please read the syllabus. Just uh, take the time and read it. It has a lot of details on many of the things. There's also like this time, this year for the first time, we split the scores into two. Because last year I still taught uh, scientific visualizations so of spatial data like volume renderings, flows, and so on. This is now split off into a separate course, CS 5635 or CS 6635, which is going to be taught, taught by Chris Johnson in the spring of 2018. For most of you in the most programs, those two pro uh, courses are treated equivalently. So if, you have, if you're in the data track, you can take I think either one or the other. Um, so like, uh, you can choose. Uh, we recommend you take both, but of course we understand that not everybody is interested in taking both. Um, and then finally, there is a Slack, and there is a homework zero out, and I'll talk about the rest later. Database course 2017, slack.com, please sign up. Uh, there is homework zero is, let me see. I'll go over this again next week. But if you go to the website, you'll find a link to the homework. And the homework zero essentially just asks you to set stuff up for the course. So it's not going to be handed in, it's not going to be graded. You should just read it and do the things that are asked in there, like a course survey, register for Slack, introduce yourselves, and so on. Okay, sorry it took a little bit longer. I got excited about some of the material and we had a delay. Um, so I'll see you guys again on Thursday, and I'm looking forward to that.